This is a story about no trespassing laws, but also... Wild Ginger! Ah! Hi, I'm Yara, and this is me pulling something out of a sidewalk. sidewalk. It's coming out of the sidewalk! Let's get home and get cooking! And making a gourmet meal out of it with an expert who can spot wild edible plants most of us wouldn't even recognize. Chanterelle mushrooms! Crown tipped coral fungus! I'm so excited! Yep, that's TikTok star Alexis Nicole Nelson, also known as the Black Forager. There's a plant growing in your neighborhood that you can use in place of eggs. She gathers, or shall I say forages, wild foods in urban areas areas and makes complex gourmet vegan meals out of them. We are using this mushroom and this tree bark to make jerky. So I joined Alexis in Columbus, Ohio to discover a hidden world of free wild foods growing within our cities. This is just a weed growing out of the sidewalk <laughs> and it can elevate the heck out of your dishes at home. But I'm also here to learn about something else because foraging in the US, like many, many things, has a really complicated past that has a lot to do with these things. Yep, no trespassing signs. In other words, no foraging here. But what if I told you that no trespassing laws were specifically designed years ago to stop people who looked like Alexis from foraging? Where black people lived, the law changed to harm them. There's a reason why there's not a lot of people who look like me who are doing this, and I'm trying very hard to change that narrative now. Okay, but to understand trespassing laws, first we need to understand foraging. So I met up with Alexis at her house. Oh, hi, hello! Hello! Oh, you're here! Hey. You're gonna be on my screen! Yeah. That was totally unscripted. This is so real. Documentary videos. Wow. But it was kind of hot outside, so let's do a little costume change and try that again. Ah, perfect. What are we gonna do first? We are heading over to a forested area called Jeffrey Park. We're gonna go see some sights, maybe see some mushrooms, I don't know. I don't wanna jinx it. Mushrooms. Right, okay, so yes, uh, the park. Okay, the first thing that was immediately apparent is that Alexis is a walking encyclopedia of plant knowledge. This is Asarum canadense, me Acer genus, Oxalis genus. Just like her TikTok videos. Taxis bacata, clava corona pixidata. My TikTok presence is like by no means. <laughs> So I started my TikTok when the world shut down for the pandemic last year, just on a whim. A little afraid of going to the grocery store right now. That's okay, I'm gonna show you some things that are growing in your neighborhood that you can eat, let's go. And I woke up the next day and it had like tens of thousands of views. I was just like, what? The children like plants? I can give them plants. Anyway, we saw a ton of stuff in the park, like this, 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 ooh, 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 ooh this, and these. But most of these weren't edible. Soon enough, we started gathering things for our gourmet vegan dinner. First up, wild ginger. So I'm gonna like give this a little scrape and have you smell. Oh, yeah. 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 This is amazing. Right? Oh. Wow. It is super gingery, oh, but also nice. a little floral. And so many people pass it all the time and have no clue that they're just walking right on by this like powerhouse of flavor and smell. Anyway, then we picked up some of these leaves. A really great thing about these is because they have a pretty invasive habit, you are doing your native plant friends a favor. And then these super cool seeds. Here, we have some curly dock seed heads. So curly dock is in the same family as buckwheat. So these seeds are gonna have like a very nutty flavor. I grind them seed husk and all, and then you can use it as a gluten-free flour. Look at you go. But by far the coolest thing of all was this. I found the mushroom. Oh! I know! Yep, woodier mushrooms. They're beautiful, they're giant. And this tree is just like so consistent. And look at this guy. I was very amazed. This feels like flesh. <laughs> it does feel very flesh. <laughs> Which don't let that put you off of it. Oh, it's so good though. They're so good. Okay, so this tree is dead. This tree is dead. And they're eating the tree. And so they are. Oh. 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 You're not a botanist by training. No. I started getting 
really, really heavily into foraging. Honestly, just because I was really broke after college. I was really sick of just like eating ramen and undressed Boca burgers every day. I remember this plant curly dock from when I was a kid and I think I saw some growing around our neighborhood. So I'm just gonna go and get some, chop it up, give it a saute and toss it into my noodles. And it like elevated the entire dish. It just added this nice vegetal tartness. And I realized I could be creating these intricate, interesting, exciting dishes that felt very out of my price range for free by just like going for a 30 minute walk around my neighborhood every day and seeing what I could find. Our foraging journey took us to distant lands within Columbus, Ohio, of course, like a sidewalk. Ah, uh, purslane. Purslane, and it's full of nutrition, your omega-3 fatty acids. And another sidewalk. Edible things can sometimes be growing out of the pavement. This is gallon soga. Oh, it's so fuzzy. They're great for adding more body to soups. And a nearby community garden. There we go, we can take a few. This beautiful like sea of purple is none other than purple shiso. We have happened upon a cornelian cherry tree. Those of you who are familiar with Middle Eastern cuisine are probably much more familiar with the cornelian cherry. In Iran, we call them zogolakhteh. Wait, say it again. I'm so ready. I want to try. I want to try. This is a very tough one. Zoral. Zoral. Achte. Achte. Perfect. Zoral achte. Zoral achte. Ah, close enough. Nice work. So I saw this TikTok of yours where you explain why you go by the name Black Forager. Black Forager is what I go by everywhere other than TikTok, and I often get the question, why? Why do you need to bring race into it? So tell me about that. Why do you go by that name? When I was going about making my page, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me in like the modern day foraging space. And to this day, here in the United States, it's still like a very predominantly white hobby. It's also really important to me just because there's a very storied history here in the United States with uh, black people, indigenous people, poor people, and their access to land and their access to food. A lot of slaves learned from a lot of indigenous peoples how to forage to fill out the little bit of food that they were given. And this was a skill set that suddenly they couldn't use anymore. No trespassing so no laws. Tres start no to trespassing pop up. laws start popping up. Black folks being able to gather their food gave them bargaining power, or worse, a reason to leave and support themselves in another way. At the end of one of your TikToks, you actually have a quote from Professor Brian Sawyer's research, yeah. which specifically links the rise of no trespassing signs in the US yep. too. All right, we're gonna briefly press pause on our foraging adventure because we actually tracked down the professor that Alexis cites in her TikTok video. That's Professor Brian Sawyers. We are here because Alexis Nicole Nelson, the black forager, cited your research in one of her TikToks. What did you find, like specifically with regards to no trespassing laws? Like, explain like I'm five as they say. Well, not like I'm five, maybe like I'm 12 or, or 13. <laughs> the story actually starts hundreds of years earlier. So England has very strict trespass laws. The moment you cross onto someone else's land, it's a serious crime. If you poach on someone else's land, one of the penalties was transportation to the American colonies. But once the settlers got to North America, all of English law gets thrown out and they develop a distinctly new set of laws. And one of the key elements is trespass is not a crime. Oh, they're like, we're done with that. Absolutely we're done. So there's not gonna be any hunting or fishing laws. People can walk wherever they want. You can let your livestock roam wherever they want. Just a reminder though, these settlers, unsurprisingly, mm. did not include black and indigenous folks in their definition of people. Okay, moving on. And the only part that was off limits was your home and immediately around there. In a lot of areas, you could actually climb over a fence if you wanted to forage or hunt or fish. Oh wow, this is very different from today. Under slavery, on most plantations, a large share of the food that enslaved people had eaten was stuff they produced themselves, because those white landowners would provide them with cornmeal and with fat back, which is like bacon, but less meat and more fat. No one could live just on that. And so everything else, all the vegetables, all the eggs, all the meat except for fat back, all that was either fished, hunted, grown, or foraged. So. Big change with the Civil War. 1860. 61 to 65. 65. After the end of the Civil War, slavery is abolished. By the end of the Civil War, all four million enslaved people are now free. And then there's new elections, but at that point, only white people can vote. And so these all white electorates vote for all white legislatures. And some of the first laws they make are laws criminalizing trespass. And it happens across the South. 
making it more difficult to feed yourself by limiting hunting, by limiting fishing, by prohibiting foraging. Interestingly, they often don't apply to the entire state. Instead, they'll pick specific counties, and those counties are disproportionately black. The pattern is really pronounced in the Deep South states, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Georgia, and both of the Carolinas. Eastern Tennessee, then as now, is predominantly white. Western Tennessee, there's a larger black population there. So what does the state legislature do? We've got one set of laws for Western Tennessee, we've got another set of laws for Eastern Tennessee. So basically, just to reiterate this, enslaved people at that time would supplement their diets with foraged foods. After slavery, you could pretty much feed yourself without working for your former slave owner. And so there's this asymmetry in which these white landowners desperately need black workers. But black people don't need these white landowners because they can feed themselves. There's journal entries from memoirs where you have white landowners complaining, saying, it's terrible, my black neighbors can feed themselves without working for me. And so you have white landowners telling all white legislatures, we need these laws. The end of slavery has made such large changes, we need these. I read a tremendous amount of 19th century literature, and part of the reason I know they were doing this against black people is they said, we are doing this specifically to make them work for us. It will confine them more. So these are like essentially mechanisms to try to ensure the continuation of as many of the conditions of enslavement yes. in the post-enslavement era. People who are willing to fight a four-year war for slavery obviously are very deeply attached to slavery. In Mississippi and South Carolina tried to institute laws, for example, called the Black Codes, where if a black person worked for a white person, they were required to call them master, and they would need written permission to leave their workplace. Apparently, like, there was a law that prevented newly freed black Americans from, I think, switching jobs? Yeah, like... and it wasn't just illegal, it was a crime, and so you could be arrested for it. Not having a job was a crime, whether you needed a job or not. And then there were the fines that came with these crimes. Crimes. Fines so high, few could actually afford them. So to pay them off, black people were pushed into forced labor. They could sell you to a white employer for the number of months <laughs> it would take for you to repay the fine. So you would have an auction on the courthouse steps that was indistinguishable from an auction of a slave that had happened five or ten years before. Is it fair to say that no trespassing laws in the United States as a whole are rooted in Racism? I think you can certainly say that. I started this project more than 10 years ago. When you read hundreds of cases, maybe even a thousands of cases, when you read hundreds of statutes, maybe even thousands of statutes, I have eliminated any other variable. If you see a no trespassing sign, if you're wondering why it's a crime to go on someone's land, just to cross it, to have a picnic, maybe to gather a few leaves, to gather a mushroom, a big part of why is an effort by white landowners to disadvantage black workers right after the Civil War. A lot of the reason why we're not out here in these wild spaces, why we're not all climbing Cornelian cherry trees and harvesting them is just because historically, systemically, we've been suppressed from doing so. But our story doesn't end here because Alexis is not only dedicated to bringing new folks into the foraging world, she also transforms her foraged finds into some incredible meals. And I was... Ooh, can I do the clap? Oh, do it, yeah, actually. For our opening dish, we are going to have a little salad with our purslane. Next, we have our shiso, and we're gonna make tiny little dumplings sauteed with our dock leaves and our wood ear mushrooms, which I have not put in front of Ooh. us yet. Would you like to do the honors of bringing them out of the bag? Yes, yes, yes I'm gonna yes, touch their please. great Darkness. and holy fleshy holiness. <laughs> And then for dessert, a cornelian cherry and wild ginger sorbet. Oh, it's so gingery. I think it is time for me to put these shiso leaves into this boiling water. <laughs> Anticlimactic! Note how they are turning green. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a blendy blend. Sounds like a self-conscious person starting up their motorcycle. <laughs> and there we go, we have our beautiful shiso mixture. And we're gonna add it to some flour that I definitely didn't pre-prepare. I'm just gonna salt bay it. We love a dated meme. Yeah. Ooh. I don't know what my, uh, my alter ego is a mad scientist. <laughs> <laughs> 
can stir in the flour. Can stir in the flour. We can start to knead it. Yeah. Look at that gluten development. <laughs> we have our cherries and our grapes. They're going into a pot. Boop. So those are gonna start simmering. So what's amazing too is that everything is vegan. All of these are vegan recipes. If you like an egg in your in your dumplings, in your pasta, I'm not gonna stop you. I actually find a lot of vegan recipes to be like super creative yeah. and unique. Like, cause I mean, I have to learn to work around mm -hmm. the things that are missing. Yeah, like how do you make savory flavors when you don't have savory meats? Precisely. Like mushroom. Like herbs that are pretty savory, mm -hmm. like your shiso. Mm -hmm. Gonna go ahead and roll it out small enough that we can just use these cooking shears Ooh, okay. to cut tiny little dumplings. And yeah. should I just roll them a little bit? Yeah, or? give them okay. a little roll. Okay. okay, so now we're gonna start gathering these guys up and they are going into the boiling water. While those are going, I'm going to add some sugar to our Cornelian cherry and wild ginger mix. So we're gonna go ahead and pour those off. There we go. Gonna add just a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of soy sauce. Cut these dock leaves in two. And I assume there's a little bit of bitterness to this. A little bit of bitterness, yeah. just the smidgens. So these guys are now going in two. We are going to add in my pride, my joy. Ooh. I only use them every once in a blue moon. These are salted ramp leaves. They're just like a punch of salty, sweet, garlicky goodness. Oh. Oh. Let's get some mirin out oh, here. Oh, yes. I'm just gonna pour a little bit in. And we're putting in our wood ear mushrooms. Oh, this is wonderful. Have you made this before? Yeah. Never done it with the um, shiso dumplings. That's new. One of the things that's so fun about foraging is you really do get to riff so much yeah. just based on what it is you're bringing home. I'm going to strain our Cornelian cherries and wild ginger. And now this is going to turn into this. We did not prepare this. No, this is definitely right. what we just saw. So now I think we're I think we're plating. Okay, let's plate. Let's plate. That's amazing. It looks great. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, those look beautiful. There we go. All right. The moment of truth. Moment of truth. Boop. <laughs> Boom. Oh. Oh my oh, god. The dumplings are perfectly cooked. They are a little bit springy because you did all of that great kneading. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with how these wood ear mushrooms came out. Here it goes. Oh. Right? And then a little bit of purslane salad. This is amazing. We just found all this food in the wild. It's coming out of the sidewalk. It's coming out of the sidewalk. And it has snap. It has that nice acidity. We have to do the sorbet before it all melts. Mm -hmm. Cornelian cherry sorbet. Oh, do you remember what it's called in Persian? Oh God, <laughs> no I don't. It's okay, so we'll say it. Zoral Akhte. Zoral Akhte. Perfect, Zoral yes. Akhte sorbet. sorbet. <laughs> Ooh, oh. I'm getting the ginger too. Yeah, it's so like silky smooth. I am actually like very impressed with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. impressed with us. I mean, you came up with the recipes. This is we amazing. all worked together on this. Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> what do you want your viewers, the people who watch your content, to to like walk away with? Foraging and being more connected to place, to your present, to your past by means of food, it's like a, it's all, it's magical. It is intrinsically inside of all of us. As we sink our teeth into those magnificent shiso dumplings, that crisp purslane salad, and um, the zogalach de sorbet, I kind of had to stop and take it all in for a sec. First off, everything we were eating, we gathered that day in the wild for free from a park, a forest, and yes, even a sidewalk. Well, multiple sidewalks. But it wasn't just that. It was what all this meant and the context we were doing it in. My thinking and something that will just kind of hit me in the face every once in a while while I'm foraging is that historically in this nation for a long period of time, people who look like me have gathered food, picked food, processed food, not for our own benefit. It has been for the benefits of whoever we were working for. So to me to do this act and have often no one but myself benefiting from it, it really just feels like giving a middle finger to this system that was inherently created to put us at a disadvantage. And in that way, I do feel like foraging as a black person is an act of rebellion. 
It's saying, for years, we were kept out of the wild food narratives. Wild food was taken out of our hands deliberately, and we still found our way back to it. And to me, that, uh, I'm not gonna cry on this video. There's something beautiful about it. I mean, yeah. it's coming back yeah. to what it was. The fact that a lot of other people of color have told me that I'm the reason why they feel comfortable enough now going into these spaces, knowing that they can identify things, knowing that they have this little bit of like self-sufficiency that they can be proud of. Nothing gets the waterworks going fast. <laughs>